All right. Um, my name is John Dundon. I uh, work with Orthopedic Institute of New Jersey. I'm here to talk about evaluation and management of osteoarthritis of the knee. We'll talk about non-operative treatment, preoperative optimization protocols, and then a little bit about total knees. I'll do a, I'm going to, I know we're running pretty far behind, so I'm going to skip certain parts about the BPCI and CJR. If anybody has any questions, they can talk to me about it later. Uh, but preoperative optimization is something I'm uh, very passionate about and something I like to talk about too. And it's, I think it's pertinent to you guys as PCPs as well. So none of my disclosures are pertinent to this. So what are the objectives of what we're trying to do? So we're trying to understand proper diagnosis of osteoarthritis of the knee, understand the principles uh, and evidence for non-operative treatment, what's acceptable, what's not, preoperative and patient optimization, bundles and costs, we're gonna cross that off, uh, indications for surgery and lowering complications. So diagnosis. So first thing, plain radiographs of the knee is really all you need for diagnosis of osteoarthritis of the knee. You should be a weight-bearing forward view of the knee. I always like to have a P, uh, flex PA because it shows the weight-bearing surface of the knee. And, it's, and people who have just the standard non-weight-bearing AP of the knee are often going to miss this osteoarthritis on people. So a good forward view knee, which is weight-bearing, including a flex PA, is going to give you all the information that you really need. Physical exam, these people are going to have limited range of motion. Oftentimes, they're going to have flexion contractures, 10, 15, 20 degrees. They're going to have varus valgus deformities, depending on some of these people, swelling and effusion. Uh, and then range of motion is going to be limited. A lot of these people are going to have pain in the backs of the knee, pain in the side of the knee. They're going to complain of stiffness, especially at the end of the day. And the more motion that they lose, the more uh, difficulty that they have with mobilization and their day-to-day -day activities. And then another thing, MRIs are not necessary for the treatment of osteoarthritis or the diagnosis. There's no, if you have a tricompartmental arthritic knee, there's absolutely no reason why you need an MRI. The x-rays tell you everything you need and you don't need to waste the money. So non-operative treatment's the first line of defense in all these people with osteoarthritis. So according to the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, the things that have good, strong evidence to support their use in clinical practice are going to be self-management programs and low-impact aerobic exercises. There's multiple good studies out there recently saying one of the best things you can do is get these people on an exercise bike. It's low impact. It improves uh, their knee range of motion. It decreases their swelling, and it helps to circulate the joint fluid through the knee. So low-impact aerobic exercise has probably some of the best evidence that you're going to find out there for treat non-operative treatment of osteoarthritis. Weight loss. There's great studies showing decreased pain and increased function for weight loss of anybody of a BMI over 25 and is a strong recommendation for the academy. NSAIDs, routine use of NSAIDs is not necessarily advised, but intermittent use of NSAIDs is very strongly recommended. And tramadol, uh, I know right now with the narcotic push, uh, tramadol has been getting a little bit of a bad rap in with that, but tramadol's got very good uh, strong recommendations by the academy for non-operative treatment. So, Inconclusive treatments. These are the things where studies are very, very mixed on whether or not they're useful or not. Electrotherapeutic modalities, and it's things like TENS units. The studies are extremely mixed on whether or not they provide any relief, whether they provide any benefit. Is it durable, short-term, or whatever else? Manual therapy and chiropractic care. Again, studies are all over the place. Uh, depending on what you read in the literature, some of the chiropractic literature is going to be more positive. Some of the orthopedic literature is going to be a little more negative. So there's no real strong recommendation for or against. Medial and motor braces, again, no good data to show that they work. And they really should be avoided in anybody who doesn't have a flexible deformity. And what does that mean? Flexible deformity is somebody who, if you flex the knee down to about 15 to 30 degrees, you should be able to open up that medial joint line. If you can't on physical exam, a medial and motor brace will only cause these people pain because you are literally pushing against the fixed deformity and all it's going to do is cause them pain. So while a lot of people do it and it can be a revenue stream for people, it really is something you gotta make sure that it's a flexible deformity if you're gonna try it. Steroid injections. Steroid injections have limited use for long-term treatment. For short-term treatment, they're good for an intermittent relief of pain, but it shouldn't be considered a long-term solution for these people. Ken Bozick and some of these other people uh, are working on financial and cost-benefit analysis on a lot of the injections and some of these non-operative treatment modalities that are more in this inconclusive plan. And they're seeing that we're spending a lot of money and we're not getting a lot of benefit out of this. And so these are the things that we can use intermittently for the right patient, but these shouldn't be long-term staples for people. 
Growth factor and PRP injections are very controversial right now. Cost a lot of money, and there's not a lot of great data out on them right now for treatment of osteoarthritis of the knee. You're gonna get different views depending on who you ask. My personal recommendation is for people with severe arthritis, they don't have a role. And the people with mild arthritis, there may be a role, but there's gonna be more studies to bear that out. And we're gonna see over the next five to 10 years as more and more studies come out, if there is that role in some of these people with more mild arthritis to treat them with those, some of these. These are the things that are recommended against by the Academy. These have strong recommendations that they provide no benefit or harm to patients. Acupuncture, lateral wedge insoles, glucosamine, Tylenol, while it's not harmful to people necessarily, they're not seeing great relief or great benefit out of it in a lot of these bigger studies. The lidocaine pain patches, they've played no role in providing any uh, relief. Narcotics have always shown negative effect. Patients given narcotics for more than 90 days uh, for osteoarthritis of the knee, 60 to 70% of those people will never get off the narcotics, even after knee replacement for the rest of their lives. So it's something that we really have to be careful of with these narcotics. Once they hit that 90-day mark, there's a good chance they're never coming off for the rest of their life, even after the knee replacement. And pain control on these people when we're giving them preoperative narcotics is very difficult. These people are having more trouble with pain control in the hospital. They're having more complications, respiratory complications, infectious complications. We can't control their pain postoperatively. So preoperative narcotics is a very strong recommendation against. And then one that's a little controversial, and I know a lot of people use, and I use on occasion too, are the hyaluronic acid injections. But here they are. So you, we'll talk about them. So there's two different basic types. There's the avian and the non-avian. The avian ones you really shouldn't give to people who have... Uh, any type of chicken or egg allergy. Uh, if you do, you can get what's called a pseudoseptic reaction with them where they have this huge inflammatory reaction. The knee gets huge, it gets swollen, and it looks like you have this huge septic knee. Um, they usually end up with an arthroscopy to be drained when they have these reactions, so it can be a little bit difficult to manage. So anybody that is questionable about that, that you're gonna administer one of these injections, stick with the non-avian brand. And monobisc and orthovisc, they do have this kind of weird uh, reaction to people's sensitivities to gram-positive bacteria. I've never even asked anybody that when I've given it before, but it's something to be aware of. So what's the evidence for these hyaluronic acid injections? Here's a whole list of studies that show no benefit. So if, when you look at them and you compare them, these are all randomized controlled trials, they all show no benefit to placebo or saline load injection. I think the most important one is this one here by Lunsgaard. They took 251 patients who had osteoarthritis of the knee, they injected they injected a third of them with the hyaluronic acid injections, a third of them they did a 20 milliliter saline load, and then a third of them they did a 2cc, uh, 2cc uh, placebo of saline. What they found is there was no difference in their Womax scores, knee function scores, SF36 scores, hoos -coos, zero difference at any point or time frame. So, and this was regardless of the intervention, uh, uh, intervention group. So again, the Academy's got a strong recommendation against, I know the one thing that we always talk about is people want a non-operative treatment option. Is it worth, and, and there is a clinical benefit to some people. If you're going to use it, I really only suggest the use of this in mild, at most moderate arthritis for our patients. I know this is touched on before, but arthroscopy for degenerative tears and osteoarthritis. I mean, here you can actually see a big complex menial meniscal tear. This is a knee scope I did, but this was actually a non-arthritic knee, so, but I just wanted to throw a meniscal tear up there so you could see it. Multiple studies. And here that, here's a whole list of studies, and one of which I'd like to go over that was in the New England Journal of Medicine, all showing that all these people, if you do arthroscopy for degenerative meniscal tears with osteoarthritis, will do at best the same, if not worse. So here's a study. This is a great study where they performed, basically they took, a, they took 92 patients to surgery and 86 were a control where it was like a sham surgery for them where they actually didn't do the surgery and they compared them to at two years. What we found, well, not what, we, what they found, I wasn't part of the study, uh, was that Womax scores and the SF36 scores were both slightly better in the group that was the control group that did not have surgery, although it wasn't statistically significant, compared to arthroscopy. So the moral of this is, you know, arthroscopy for these degenerative meniscal tears, we shouldn't be performing, and that's why I don't recommend, once you see arthritis, we don't even want the MRI. Because the first thing the patients see is they see, I have a meniscal tear. They bring you to their MRI report, I have a meniscal tear. I need my meniscal tear taken care of. Well, you have arthritis. Arthritis is a problem, or the arthritis is what we need to treat and what we need to manage. But they see meniscus tear, and they think they need surgery. So I think it's an important part for all of us to be on the same page. These degenerative meniscal tears, they just don't 
they don't do well with arthroscopy. They almost all have, when they have their scope, two years later, progress onto the total knee. So it's something to think about as we're going forward. Inserts, people have heard about inserts. People always come in and talk about, can you just put something in there? They've always failed miserably and they always come up with a new one. This is the uni spacer here. They basically put this inside the knee in order to give it a little bit of a space. Every single one of the patients in this study went on to a total knee replacement. They universally don't work. They always come up with a new form of some type of spacer to put in and it always doesn't work. Uh, this one, six of the 12 that they did in this study dislocated. So the spacers don't work. So when you look at all these things, the next step, a logical step down is gonna be the total knee. So the most important part is actually the preoperative risk and optimization. So these are our people, and why do we do this, and why do we take this step before we move on to the total knee, and why is this so important? And this is why the PCP is so imperative in creating good functional outcomes in these total knee patients. Because the complication rates, if we can't control them, if we can't optimize them, go through the roof. The cost to the system, the cost to the patient, you know, and what we're having to deal with goes through the roof. So BMI, the super obese have an 8.4 times higher likelihood of infection than the average risk patient. Eight times. You know, the, the biggest thing that we see are infections and wound drainage problems. They have trouble with the narcotics postoperatively because they have such weight on their chest. They have trouble with sleep apnea and breathing, and then we have difficulty with respiratory infections and pneumonia. Smokers, uh, this is an absolute no-go for me. I will not operate on smokers. Uh, smokers have a 24 higher percent higher risk of postoperative complications. The wound complications are catastrophic. They end up with significantly higher rates of pneumonia, postoperative infections, and their wounds just don't tend to heal very well. I know a lot of the trauma guys uh, will force them to quit too when they do these. And then diabetes, uncontrolled diabetes, risk of wound complications is through the roof with people. If we can't control their glycine hyper, if we can't keep them with a blood sugar under 200 in the perioperative period, the risk of wound complications goes up significantly. The risk of infection goes up significantly. And these become difficult people to manage. And the one thing I tell these people, the smokers and the diabetics especially, if we can't manage the wound, these are the people who end up going with the catastrophic results in the amputations. So it's so, so imperative that we get this stuff controlled ahead of time before we even think about surgery. So something I've been involved in for years now, and uh, we're doing it here as well. I do, uh, I've been involved with what's called a readmission risk assessment tool we call an RAT, which categorizes people based on infection risks, diabetes, smoking, cardiovascular disease, uh, neurocognitive behavior, preoperative function, and diabetes. And what we do is we score them based on this scale. And in the original work at NYU, we found higher rates of readmission just in monitoring these patients. And these higher rates of readmission, we see tw uh, three times the readmission rates in diabetics who are uncontrolled. People, with, people who have previous DBTs who weren't controlled well, eight times the risk. And what we see is the more risk factors that they have in, the higher the risk of readmission. If they score greater than six on this thing, greater than 10 times the rate of readmission. So this is a very strong tool. It's something that we have to do ahead of time before we start getting into these. We've actually started working on research here where we've been sending letters to the physicians. We've started empowering the physicians. We've started contacting the physicians saying, hey, these people are at risk. We need to do things to optimize them before we do the total knee. Because anybody can throw in a total knee. Getting the patient through it and getting them a good result is what we're trying to do. And this is where you guys are so important in all of this. Because I can't, I can't manage this. I can only see the things and try to, try to talk to you guys to get through. And so that way we can all get on this together and all be on the same team. Uh, here, here's our data at Morristown, and I'll just run through it quickly. We had about 17% who had R rate greater than 4, and greater than 4 is kind of our cutoff where we start to see the complications and the odd risk of readmissions start to go through the roof. And you can see here, 5.5% of our patients were readmitted within 30 days who had an R rate greater than 4. 2.8, less than 4, so half. half. And so if we, can get the, uh, if we can get these people controlled preoperatively, we're seeing half the risk of re uh, readmission. Same thing here when you compare greater than six. People who have greater than six risk factors out on this scale. 17 times the readmission rate. These people are getting readmitted at a rate of 33% when we look at them. So they're having huge complication rates. And we're seeing, what we're seeing especially is people who have obesity, people have poor preoperative function, BT risk factors, and then the tobacco is starting to go down because I think most people are starting to make them stop. So that's what we're seeing in this. So 
the next question becomes, this is a good friend of mine, Rich Iorio. Uh, he's out, of, out of, up out of Harvard, and he talks about this a lot. What are the moral hazards that we run into it? So the one thing that you'll talk about with patients, and we uh, have the conversation all the time, well, why can't I have my knee replaced? I know my BMI is 50. I know I'm smoking. Why can't I have it replaced? I want it replaced. I can't live like this. And this is what a lot of this paper deals with, is the difference between non-maleficence and beneficence. So obese people, smokers, they get the same benefit out of a total knee that people do who don't have those problems. They just don't go up to the same level. And their complication rates are through the roof. So this is kind of where we have to step in as a group. We have to say your risk of a poor outcome is so much greater because of your complications. If we can manage this, then all of a sudden we get a much better outcome and a much better overall result. So some people still argue for strict patient autonomy. I'm not one of those people. The other thing is people argue the cost of the system of the whole, and that's where you get into the BPCI and the CJRs, which we're going to skip over that on the constraints of time. But I'm more of a, a person who believes in more of the non-maleficent side. Everybody's got a different point of view. Got to do first do no harm. Do whatever we can do to optimize these people. And once we hit that point where this is as good as they're going to get, we got to go forward, we got to go forward. There's not a problem that, with that in the world. We should proceed forward if people have risk factors. But we have to get those risk factors the best we can before we move on. So we're going to skip this because we're behind. But if you, anybody has any questions, I'm more than happy to go over the BPCI and the CGR stuff. So what are the indications of surgery? We've worked them up. We've gotten everything optimized. What are we going to do to move forward? So first, failure of non-operative treatment. Everybody has to fail non-operative treatment before we're willing to go. Nobody gets a knee replacement on the first visit. They have to have bone-on-bone -bone arthritis or at least a big osteochondral lesion, something to be able to qualify. They have to be medically optimized, and they have to be compliant. If they're not compliant, they're not going to do well. Compliance is probably one of the biggest things you can do. You have to tell people up front, this is going to be a three-month recovery. It's going to take a year full recovery. It's a rough road. Total knees hurt. They're not fun. We do everything we can to keep people comfortable. We do blocks. We do numbing medicine. We do Expiril solutions and everything else. But it's still a difficult recovery. Joint deformity and locking. A lot of these people come in with big contractures, big deformities. Uh, those are obviously the indication. And progressive limitation of joint motion. Where they're having trouble getting out of cars, getting up and down stairs. So total knee arthroplasty. So total knee is more of a resurfacing now than anything else. So what we're doing is we're resurfacing the entire femoral surface and the entire tibial surface with a little polyethylene spacer in between. Uh, the resurfacing of the patella is a little bit controversial. Uh, people down in Philadelphia, Craig Isleyolite, some of the guys over in uh, Greece, they, they do not routinely resurface the patella. They believe that you can keep the patella and it does well. They do find a little bit better rates of kneeling on people who don't resurface the patella. I'm a patella resurfacer because I'll tell you on the other side, there's a significantly higher rate of revision surgery in total knees in people who don't resurface them. But it's something people talk about. Can I keep my kneecap? Can I not keep my kneecap? I'm a believer in the resurfacing at all times. Some people are different. Everybody's got a different view on it. You're always trading one complication for the other. I, I want the lower revision rate. They want the, uh, the less anterior knee pain. You kind of trade for it. This is for tricompartmental arthritis with a conservative treatment. Bilaterals, uh, another little bit of a controversial topic. Some people don't do any bilaterals. Some people are very literal about bilaterals. I kind of find myself a little bit in between. Um, I definitely do bilaterals. Um, they're great for having one recovery, but it's a heck of a surgery for people. Uh, it's indicated for bilateral severe OA. You will find in the literature increased risk of mortality, increased risk of complications, uh, and it's something that you got to take very seriously. I make all these patients, and most of the people, guys here who do it at Morristown, make everybody get a cardio, uh, cardiology evaluation before they have a, a bilateral total knee. Exclusion criteria, ASA over 3, over 75, ischemic heart disease, decreased left ventricular function, any type of significant renal impairment, uncontrolled diabetes, which in my opinion you shouldn't be doing anyway. Same thing with morbid obesity. You probably shouldn't be doing them anyway, let alone for bilaterals. Significant pulmonary disease cirrhotics, CVAs, or significant risk for vascular disease. The one exception I'll make in these rules are like with this patient, he's got a 20 degree deformity, or some of my people especially have a 30 degree valgus deformity. I'll do bilaterals a little bit beyond the indications for those people because when you straighten them out, they have such a leg length discrepancy that they can't ambulate and they can't recover their other knee, they can't recover the knee. So my, my exception to the rule will be people with very large deformities. So if you have a large deformity, I'll tend to do them both, even if they're a little bit higher risk, because they just can't recover on the one knee. Unis. So unis, you can replace the inside, the outside, the patellofemoral. 
a while ago in fellowship. I had a guy who did all three at once, and I can't tell you why. But the, you have different types of bearing services. You have mobile bearing and fixed bearing. Everybody's got their camp and where they go. The fixed bearing's really, you can only use a fixed bearing on a lateral. The lateral has a very unique mechanism uh, from the screw hole mechanism of the knee, so you can't use a mobile bearing on it. These indications are for isolated medial. There's different thought and philosophies on whether lateral the unis, you should be doing them or not. I'm a big believer in only medial unis, so you kind of get a little bit of a skewed view from me. Uh, so this is the indications for the medial uni only. Um, so you gotta have an intact ACL and PCL. You gotta be anterior medial arthritis. Anterior medial arthritis on the lateral x-ray shows you that your ACL is intact. If you have posterior medial wear, you have a deficient ACL. If you have a deficient ACL, you should not do a uni. There are guys out there reconstructing the ACL and throwing it in a uni. Results aren't great. Uh, just do a total at that point, um, in, at least in my opinion. So no more than grade three arthritis. You should not have bone-on-bone -bone arthritis in the patella. Up to grade three, you really can get away with it in the patella. Uh, you got to have a correctable deforming. This goes along to the medial unloader brace I was talking about. This is a bone cutting procedure. You can't do any ligament balancing on it. It's not like a total knee. A total knee, you can do anything in the world to it. You can fix a total knee, you can straighten a total knee, you can do whatever you need to do with a total knee, ligament wise, balancing wise, everything else. These are strictly bony cuts. You can't play with the ligaments. So if the deformity is not correctable, it can't be done. And that's, these are the people who actually will do okay with the unloader braces. So flexion contracture less than 15 degrees. Again, you can't do ligament balancing, so that's why the contracture deformity. And uh, you gotta have flexion past 115, and it's contraindicated in rheumatoid arthritis because they believe that you're gonna have joint disease in the rest of the knee. So these unis, they do really well in the right patient. When you stretch the indications, the failure rates approach 30% at 10 years. So don't stretch the indications is the big thing with this. So everybody likes to talk about robots and computers and all this other stuff. Computer-assisted surgery, in my opinion, is starting to go the way of the dinosaur. Uh, it's mostly a fixed-bearing thing. It's really going in to robotic-assisted surgery and inertial navigation pressure balancing systems. So the big, bulky computer-assisted models, you're starting to lose them out of, the, out of the ORs. But there's all sorts of different robotic arms that you can use. So there's the, the Mako. That's probably the most popular one out of Stryker. And all these require some type of pre or not all, but most of them require some type of advanced preoperative imaging, whether it's a CT or an MRI. So the striker is uh, probably the most popular one, as you can see, for total knees. Great for unis, uh, but very expensive. It's a million-dollar robot. Uh, Zimmer had to come out with their own because they got jealous that Stryker had one, so they got the Rosa. Now Smith & Nephew's got the Navio. Either way, it's all a robotic arm that uses a computer system to try to keep you making your cuts and your alignments within a program. So the arm will not let you deviate out. There is absolutely no evidence to show that these improve alignment or functional outcomes. No evidence. All right, but what they're seeing this in is in low volume surgeons, it's improving some of their alignment. So high volume surgeons, zero impact just slows them down. All right, the low volume surgeons, there's a question as to whether or not they're gonna see some results. The really cool stuff coming out now is the inertial navigation and the pressure balancing. So these are all using accelerometers and gyroscopes inside the knee with small, inside the wound in order to try to reachieve the mechanical and anatomic alignment of the knee. Very neat, uh, they're just kind of hitting out now. Um, uh, they're great for deformity surgery. For the basic primary knee, it's not worth the cost in my opinion, but they're neat systems. And then pressure balancing, this is something that's starting to come into focus. This is basically like a little spacer. They can tell you what the pressures are in your knee to see if you balance the knee right. So you put it in there in a computer chip and it'll, it'll uh, send a Blu-ray uh, signal out to a computer screen outside of the OR that'll tell you what your pressure is on each side and whether you need to focus on balancing your knee better. Something neat, something just starting out. It's coming out for most systems, so we'll keep tuned and see how that goes. A lot of people talk about custom-made implants and I have to have the knee that's made for me and all these other things. Most of the ones that you hear about are actually not. They're patient-specific instrumentation. So what they're doing is you're getting an MRI to plop on there to make your cuts to put in the same out-of-the-box total knee that everybody else gets. So you're wasting all that money and they're still not getting a custom knee but they advertise it like that. Custom made, this is actually a custom made knee. The conformance is a custom made knee. Uh, it's based off of a CT scan and it, it comes in a box. You get a little tiny box, it gets delivered at the door with a model and the, the, it's significantly higher cost up front, but the uh, difference is you're only having opening up one box in the OR so it decreases cost there. Whether or not it's giving you increased range of motion, benefit at all, there is no data for it, but it is, one, it is the 
like they say right there on their advertisement, the only true patient-specific total knee. So with that being said, I promised you I'd cut it a little short. Uh, are there any questions? No? Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon. I don't know how long you guys have been sitting here, but if you want to stand up and stretch for a minute, do some jumping jacks, feel free. Uh, my name is uh, Rich Shank. I'm director of orthopedic trauma at Morristown. And I was uh, asked to talk about fractures of the knee, which is a pretty broad topic. So we're going to look at a general evaluation, distal femur fractures, patella fractures. I'm going to just mention knee dislocations and talk about proximal tibia fractures. We're not going to talk about pediatric fractures. Each of these topics I could talk about for hours, so it's a lot of information, and I was asked to talk in 20 minutes. I'm going to try to stick to that, if not shorter. So you've had an introduction to the anatomy to the knee, and the good thing about anatomy is that it's pretty constant. So we have certain landmarks that we look at. As with any patient, you want to inspect. You can get a lot of information from just looking at uh, the knee, palpate, check range of motion, do neurovascular testing, and there are some special tests that can be done. So on inspection, you want to look for swelling or effusion, ecchymosis. Is there a skin injury? There, keep in mind there can be a significant soft tissue injury even if it's a closed injury. You can look at bruising. If you see dimpling, that's usually indicative of a fracture that's buttonholed through a fascia. You want to look at surgical scars. You want to get an idea, does the, basically does the leg look crooked or does it look straight? And usually, but not always, there's an opposite side to compare to. Palpate, you want to palpate areas of tenderness and again, compare to the other side, are there any defects? And this will guide you as to whether you need any imaging. If there's any bony tenderness, an x-ray should be performed. So on palpation, is the skin tense or firm? You have to be concerned with the compartment syndrome, which is probably the um, bane of all orthopedic surgeons. This is usually a clinical diagnosis. Occasionally, there's a device um, made by Stryker where you can measure the compartments, but usually it's a clinical diagnosis, and the device is used only if you can't examine the patient, if they're obtunded or unconscious. You want to look for the five Ps that uh, we talk about. Is it an open fracture or a closed fracture? Is it a buttonhole? or is it an obvious open injury? If you're not sure if the, there's an open injury in the knee, you can do the saline load test, where you can load the knee up with saline and see if the, the fluid extravasates through what you're worried about being an open injury. If there's any doubt, patients should be taken to the OR and washed out, because the morbidity of missing an open joint injury is, is pretty high compared to the morbidity of a knee scope where you can just wash out the knee joint. So in terms of range of motion, we talk about active motion and passive motion. Always ask the patient to first move their knee, and that's active motion. What can the patient do themselves? If they can't move it at all themselves, I would say stop there and get an x-ray. If they can move their knee, then you can try passive motion, and that's you moving it within their pain tolerance. And again, is there a fusion? Is it large? Is it small? All these are factors in helping you decide what your next step is going to be. You want to do a neurovascular exam. Just asking a patient if they can wiggle their toes is not a neurovascular examination. You actually want to check all the dermatomes and all the muscle groups. You've already heard about the special uh, test for ligamentous and meniscal injuries. And one thing I want to also emphasize is that with fractures around the knee, you can also get an extensor mechanism rupture. That's a tearing of the quadriceps tendon off the patella or a tearing of the patella tendon, either off the patella or off the tibial tubercle. If a patient cannot do a straight leg raise, it might be because of pain, in which case sometimes we inject the knee with some lidocaine uh, to get rid of the pain component of it. If they can't do a straight leg raise, one has to be concerned with a disruption of the ex extensor mechanism. There's different criteria for whether or not and when you should get an x-ray. In my opinion, basically, if there's any bony tenderness, you should get an x-ray. MRIs are very limited in, in the scope of fractures around the knee. 
So what do we look at when we look at x-rays? Generally, x-rays in the knee in the trauma setting is a little different than in, in a non-traumatic setting. In the trauma setting, we usually get two x-rays, an AP and a lateral. And the thing that I want to point out is on the lateral view here, you see the two condyles overlapping each other, and that's a good lateral view. Typically, when I get x-rays on the outside and they're brought in, I get this all over on your far right is your lateral. That doesn't really give you the information that you need. Occasionally, oblique views are helpful in determining a tibial plateau fracture. Um, they were commonly done before CAT scans were, were so readily accessible. When I first went into practice, it was actually difficult to get a CAT scan. Uh, that's because I'm so old, but now CAT scans are readily accessible. You can also get what's called either, uh, you can get a tunnel view, and you can also get what's either called a sunrise or a skyline view to look at the patellofemoral problems. So each view gives you information. You have to remember that an x-ray is a two-dimensional picture of a three-dimensional object, which is why we get multiple views at a minimum, two views at 90 degrees to try to put together in our heads what the problem is. It's best for bony injuries, but you can get some soft tissue information from it. So you've already heard a couple of talks about anatomy, so I'm gonna skip that. But it's good to repeatedly look at x-rays, even of normal x-rays, so you have an in your mind what's normal and what isn't. And not every patient reads the textbook is what normal is supposed to be. There's obviously some variation. Uh, just to mention a fabella, I'm not sure if it was mentioned in the earlier talk. It's a sesamoid bone in the lateral head of the gastrocnemius muscle. It's not a fracture. You can tell it's not a fracture because the margins are smooth and well corticated. In a fracture, at least an acute fracture, the margins are always irregular and jagged. Sometimes we see what's called a bipartite patella. That's a patella that has not completely fused. And on palpation this area, it would be non-tender if there's no fracture. And if you're concerned that it might be a fracture, in this case, an MRI might be useful. But by physical examination and x-ray, you can usually tell if it's a bipartite patella or a fracture. So again, you should have a systematic review of how you look at a knee x-ray, just like you should have a systematic review on how you do everything. That way you're less likely to miss anything. You start from point A, you go to point whatever. Your systematic review may be different than someone else's, and that's okay, but you should follow the same pattern whenever you look at things. So one way to do that is you can outline all the bones, either literally draw on the x-ray or in your mind. Uh, in a fracture, there will be an irregularity, a, a sharp area, an edge. Uh, if it's smooth, it's probably not a fracture. So we're going to touch on distal femur fractures, which I could probably talk like uh, several hours on. The distal femur is divided into a couple of areas. One is called the supracondylar areas, which means just what it says, above the condyles. And that's the area that you see here. Oops. And then the, these are the two condyles. There's the medial femoral condyle and the lateral femoral condyle. The distal femur has a, a shape that's important for us as surgeons to know. For example, it's narrower anteriorly than it is posteriorly, and that matters where we put our plate. If we put our plate here, it will affect the alignment compared to putting it here. So we need to know for that manufacturer, was that plate designed to be placed more anterior or was it designed to be placed more posterior? So distal femur fractures have a bimodal distribution. We see them in young patients with high energy, motor vehicle accidents, motorcycles, horseback riding, or we see them in elderly patients which are relatively low, injury, uh, low energy injuries. The classification for femur fractures is used, useful for uh, research. Type A is an extra articular. In other words, the fracture does not involve the joint. And then from one, two, and three depends on the amount of comminution or the amount of pieces. A B type is a fracture only involving a condyle, and it could be a medial condyle, lateral condyle, or a posterior condyle. And then type C is um, based on the amount of comminution above the joint and the amount of comminution in the joint or both. Most of these, if not all of these, need surgery. So here's an example of an A1, which is a supracondylar fracture above the joint, not comminuted, mainly two pieces. 
Here's a, an A3 showing a supracondylar femur fracture not involved in the joint that has several pieces. This is the type B fracture involving only the medial femoral condyle. In this case, it's non-displaced, as you see from the fracture line. And in this picture, you see in the middle x-ray, the fracture line here of the posterior condyle, also known as a Hoffa fracture. And this picture shows a, a type C2 fracture. That's a fracture that involves the joint, and the portion above the joint or the supracondylar portion is very comminuted. So we need to inspect again, look to see is it an open fracture or not, because that's going to change your management and how quickly you need to address this patient. Initially, patients are placed into a big bulky dressing called a Jones dressing and an immobilizer or a long leg splint until they're ready for surgery. If it's a high energy injury, they tend to swell quite a bit, which makes definitive treatment uh, not possible initially. We image them, as mentioned, we need to know whether it's intraarticular or not. Typically, if we think that there's too much swelling to definitively treat a patient, we will place an external fixator, pull traction, and then get a CAT scan when things are in, in more reasonable position. If we don't think we need to do that, do that, we'll get a CAT scan before surgery and plan on doing everything in one stage. So here's an example of a distal femur fracture. An external fixative was placed. In this case, the alignment is not great, but the most important thing is getting the length. And then the patient was brought back to the operating room. This is during the course of surgery. This is a fluoroscopic picture. You can see the fracture of the posterior condyle fixed here. The alignment is obtained here, temporarily fixed with two cross K wires to allow for placement of a, a rod and a plate in this case, which is unusual. Usually it's one or the other. So again, we want to temporize the fractures that we don't think we can fix in one sitting, and that would be because of swelling. And then we then bring them back and most often use plates and screws as a construct, occasionally uh, rods. So on your left, you see an example of the external fixator on this patient's injury. And here's a plate and screws. And this is looking at from the front. This is an AP view. This is a lateral view. And over on the right, you see uh, treatment with a rod and a surclage wire. Generally, surclage wires are uh, poo-pooed uh, in the treatment of fractures because it's, they're thought to disrupt the blood supply to the fragment and the fragment uh, may not go on to heal. So you've heard about the soft tissue of the knee. Let's go on to the patella. The patella is the largest sesamoid uh, in the body. It increases the mechanical advantage of your extensor mechanism. The quadriceps inserts to the top of it or the proximal pole. The patella tendon inserts onto the inferior pole, and there's a strong soft tissue on either side of it. So how do we injure patella? It's from one of two ways. The most common way is from an indirect force. We slip or fall and we get a forceful contraction of our quadriceps and the patella fractures, and we usually get a transverse pattern. Uh, the other way is direct blow, such as a knee against a dashboard or direct strike, like a baseball bat against the, the patella. And those are usually uh, multi-fragmentary or comminuted patterns. So at the top, you see a non-displaced transverse fracture. This is a displaced transverse fracture. These are from indirect means. The fractures on the bottom here is from a direct means from a direct blow. When looking at the x-rays, we want to get an idea of whether the patella tendon or the quadriceps tendon is ruptured, and that's going to be determined by where the patella is sit seated on the lateral view. There are certain ratios that we look at between how long the patella tendon should be compared to the patella, and uh, it's usually not a very difficult diagnosis. I also want to emphasize that a patella dislocation is not the same thing as a knee dislocation. A knee dislocation is a potentially devastating injury that needs to be addressed rapidly. A patella dislocation is nowhere near as, as serious. So here's a transverse patella fracture, AP and lateral views. 
Here's a uh, vertical patella fracture, which rarely needs surgical intervention. You always want to look to see if it's an open fracture or not. Can a patient do a straight leg raise? If they can, it means that the extensor mechanism is intact, which would mean the quadriceps tendon, the patella, and patella tendon are not disrupted. So when do we and when we don't do surgery? We can basically do surgery if the patient can do a straight leg raise and if there's a minimum articular step off. There's really no golden number as to what that is, and that may vary from person to person based on their training and experience. If it's going to be non-operative, the patient's get immobilized with their knee straight for a couple of weeks, and then they usually get placed into a hinge knee brace to start mobilizing the knee so it doesn't get stiff. All open fractures need to be operated on. If a patient cannot do a straight leg raise or there's a large articular step off, these need to be fixed. There's different ways to fix these. The picture on your left is a cerclage wire. The middle picture is a, called a tension band wire. And the picture on your right would be a hybrid type fixation with plates and screws. So here's an example of what's called a tension band wire, which is very effective treatment for this injury. And here's other different constructs and combinations based on the amount of pieces there are and where they are. I show this picture because here's a patella fracture that was fairly simple, it was transverse, and the patient uh, did not want an open incision. So one of the surgeons she saw decided that they would do this percutaneously, which they did with these screws and washers. The problem is that there's a large articular step off, and this is going to be doomed to post-traumatic arthritis. Here's another patella fracture, transverse in nature, relatively easy to fix, tension band wiring with screws, and you can see a large gap in the fracture. This probably will not heal. There's a gap because the threads are in the fracture site, keeping it from being compressed. Fractures heal very well when they're compressed. When they're not compressed, they frequently do not heal. So surgical technique is very important. Here's another transverse fracture treated with a screw and tension band wire. And I just show you this because while the reduction is pretty good, you can see how long these wires are rather than being cut flush with the bone. So every time this patient would try to bend their knee, they would have pain from the wire sticking into their thigh. So there's all different ways to fix these. Sometimes they're not fixable. This was a knee, knee against a dashboard. Postoperatively, these patients should be able to be made weight bearers tolerated. They're usually given crutches just to help them with balance. And we're going to move on to tibial plateau fractures now. The so tibial plateau fractures in the trauma world are commonly uh, produced from a bumper injury. And here's an example of a tibial plateau fracture. And if you look at the x-ray, there's a depression of the joint here, you can see the knee is subluxed, and the fracture actually comes all the way down to here. So there's a difference between low energy and high en energy in terms of how we look at these. If it's a high energy injury, such as this one, which is the same picture as this, it needs to be treated much more aggressively and in stages versus one that's low energy. If a patient has pre-existing arthritis, that will change the management of management as well, and some of them just go on to a primary um, knee replacement. I'm not going to talk about the anatomy or the muscle insertions. Again, soft tissue injury. This patient on the right here is a longshoreman who fell, broke his tibia out to sea. It took them five days to get him back to shore, and you can see it's, it's a closed fracture, but the extensive soft tissue injury delaying definitive treatment. So when we look at x-rays, what do we look at? We're looking at a couple of things. The end of the femur should line up with the top of the tibia. And we want to look at the joint line and see if there's any disruption. And sometimes it can be deceiving that it's, it's difficult to see. If you look on the picture on your right, there's an inclination of the joint line. So if you take an x-ray in this plane, you may miss some injury to the joint 
So the beam of the x-ray should be more in this direction. And occasionally, as I mentioned before, oblique x-rays are obtained to get more information on the, the plateau. So we look at the picture on the right. You see here's the joint knocked down to here. And the tibial plateau is widened compared to the distal femur. The lateral tibial plateaus usually occur from a valgus or knock knee stress where the end of the femur acts as a battering ram and knocks down the joint surface of the tibia. And CTs are invaluable in the assessment of these injuries. So we talk about classification of uh, tibial plateau fractures. They were came up with by uh, Dr. Shasker, who I, who I had the opportunity to do some of my fellowship with. In uh, 1979, he wrote a landmark paper on the classification and treatment of these, which revolutionized how we treat these today, and very little has actually changed. There are six types of plateau fractures, and on the, this should be a type one, it's just a condyle fracture, there's no joint depression. If you put this whole piece up here, the joint will be restored. A type two is a split of the condyle and a joint depression. Here's the joint here that's knocked down. A type three is a pure depression. There's no exit of the fracture out the condyle, and this is usually seen in elderly patients. As we go up the scale, the amount of energy absorbed by the limb goes up. A type four, which is here, is a medial plateau fracture, which most people akin to a knee dislocation and a very careful vascular uh, examination is required, and these all need to be fixed. This is a type 5 where it involves the la medial plateau and the lateral plateau, but there's still continuity of the shaft. And a type 6 is where there's no continuity of the shaft and both condyles are involved. So historically, these plateau fractures were treated with uh, traction and casting, and the results were horrible. And as I said, in 1979, Dr. Shatsky came out with his landmark paper. He also was instrumental in designing implants to fix these fractures. And uh, we like to think that our treatment for these are much better today and continues to evolve. So when do we operate? Well, articular step off is not really a good indication. You'd think it would be. But the knee can actually tolerate a lot of joint depression. And it also depends where the depression is. The most reliable way to tell if someone needs surgery on a depressed plateau fracture is by taking them to the operating room, giving them some sedation, and doing a valgus stress of their knee in 30 degrees. And if it opens more than 15 degrees on the opposite side, then it should be fixed. All type four, fives, and sixes should be fixed as well. So our treatment goals are to have the patient be pain-free, restore range of motion, have them have a normal gait, and get back to normal activities. We need to restore the patient's length of their limb, their mechanical axis, and their joint congruity. And of course, we want to avoid infection. There's different ways to treat these plateau fractures. Casting is pretty uncommon. An external fixator is usually used as provisional treatment for the first week or two or maybe three until soft tissue swelling resolves. Spatial frames are rarely used in this part of the country for these fractures. In other parts of the world, they're used commonly. And it should be intramedullary nail is sometimes used. But the workhorse is plates and screws. So if you have a limb like this and you're going to stage a treatment, you need to know where you're going to put your external fixator pins. You don't want to put them in the zone of injury, and you don't want to put them where potentially your plate and screws are going to be because it'll potentially increase your infection rate. So sometimes we actually draw out on the patient's leg where different things are. This is an example of a spatial frame, which, as I said, in this part of the country is rarely used for these fractures. And there's different ways that these can be fixed. On your left, you see a tibial rod and a plate uh, and screws. On the right, you see a screw and a tibial rod. But this is the workhorse. On your left, you see a lateral plate with multiple screws. The middle picture is a medial and lateral plate based on the fracture geometry. And the picture on your right are actually three plates 
uh, medial lateral and posterior. So here's a case I showed you before. This is actually a lady that fell down a flight of stairs. It, she was brought to Overlook. They felt uncomfortable treating her, so she, she was transferred here. She had a lot of swelling, so she was brought to the OR, and I placed an external fixator. Now, if you look at this, you say, you know, this looks pretty good in the external fixator. Getting the CAT scan after the external fixator was placed, you can see a big piece of the joint is knocked down well below the articular surface. So about three and a half weeks later, when her swelling improved to allow for two incisions, she was brought back for a surgical reconstruction with two plates and, two, and uh, multiple screws. So the most common complication of treating these injuries is orthofibrosis or a stiff knee. The more complicated the fracture, the less likely someone will get full range of motion, so we want them to get functional range of motion. In other words, we want them to get range of motion that allows them to do the things that they want to do. Occasionally, there are ligamentous injuries that get addressed later, and uh, meniscal injuries get addressed later as well. It's really not feasible to address them at the time of taking care of the fracture. Some of these patients do go on to post-traumatic arthritis and do end up needing knee replacements. We are always concerned about compartment syndrome in the early stages of the injury and following the surgery, and we're always wary of nerve and arterial injuries. Outcomes we know are better in patients who are younger, less than 40. If the fracture is unicondylar or on one side of the knee, they have good bone stock, which makes the reconstruction better. If there's less than five degrees of axis deviation of what's normal alignment, and they have better results if they do not have a meniscal tear or a ligament tear. And of course, if they don't have an infection, that helps their outcomes as well. About 20% of these patients will have a secondary procedure of some sort. That's it. Any questions? Yes. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Okay, so damage control orthopedics, I was found out yesterday I was supposed to talk on it, so I didn't prepare a talk. Damage control orthopedics is when a patient comes in, usually multiply injured, and in the old days we used to fix everything at once. And the trend now is to fix the most critical things and to do provisional treatments such as external fixation and then bring patients back in stages as they get better to fix each injury. So if a patient has five different broken bones, we may put on five external fixators and then a few days later take one off and fix that bone, a few days later fix the other bone. We think physiologically it's better for patients. Anything else? Okay, thank you. Thank you.